Hi folks, today we discuss biostatistics. Spoiler alert, I haven't included all concepts because it would be technically impossible to cover them all in a single presentation. I have only collected some basic and advanced concepts, the ones that are often misconstrued. There are, of course, basic terms like modes or variables, but those are only enclosed as they are part of a larger discussion. Besides, all definitions you will meet in those slides are, in my own words, either adapted from existing ones or non-inherently stated by myself. Lastly, as a background music for this presentation, I have chosen jazz, George Gershwin's Piano Preludes, because I think that statistics and jazz have a lot of in common, immense improvisations, imaginations, and degrees of freedom. So let's begin, shall we? Here I list three main trends in biostatistics based on the degree of abstraction. You will read their definitions later or pause the video and read them now. I'm not going to read my own slides ad verbatim. Some may argue that there is much more to say about Euclid than what is included in my definition. While that's true, I have characterized these efforts based on my own experiences within the frame of what I have studied or published about. Here I use statistics in singular form. You know that the word statistics can be used both as singular and plural. In the current slide, I present a hypothetical scenario to show how each of the trends would reach a solution. Let's say we have 210 women with primary infertility and a possible cause that is viewed is deficiency of several trace metals that contribute to the suboptimal levels of the LH hormone, also known as lutropin, which is responsible for inducing ovulation together with FSH and helping with the growth of corpus luteum or the yellow body in the ovaries. Because in the healthy women of reproductive age, LH levels quickly rise just before ovulation, the study aims to measure the plasma trace elements 36 hours prior to the proposed ovulation day, over the four consecutive menstrual cycles. So, the study construct is proper. Now, the descriptive statistics would typically measure the means and standard deviations of the plasma metals, covariances, correlations between each and paired variables, and check whether the correlation coefficient is larger than 0.7 to be confident about the strong associations. Inferential statistics would stratify women based on various criteria and model those stratified samples for probability, even run predictive inferences in the fitted model. Euclid statistics would evaluate the data through holomorphic operations looking at each domain as a complex valued function of differentiable variables that are assumed as manifolds in a spatial unit where the tangent sits within n root of differential expression. Data triangulations and inferences at the infinitesimal point would help with predictions. I have written a solid number of articles and books in medicine, law, medical law, and behavioral health, but these two ones are exclusively about the current topic. In the next two slides, I classify the statistical data. It is better that you read my slides yourself, undistracted, as there is no point in my reading of my own slides or equations. Here I want you to attend the right column of the table where I show the specific charts that are proper for presenting certain data, and this one is for the quantitative data. Next come the variables. From here, I will let you explore the slides and I will only interrupt if there is a need to interpret by bringing examples or definitions which are not included due to the space limit.
notice a rare term valence. The reason I use it is to characterize the data by dimensionality or valency because it is essential to case control studies, either prospective or retrospective, that require smart inclusions and exclusions during the sampling process. Just like in chemistry, where each element has valency, a capacity to bond or combine, the statistical variables too, including the confounders, have dimensionality. The dimensionality of statistical data is dynamic. It changes depending on the study or situation. For example, age as a confounder can significantly impact or distort the associations between the independent and dependent variables in a study targeting the clotting profile or osteoporosis, but in a study of trophoblastic disease that occurs in reproductive age women, age will not be a vigorous confounder. Thus, the valence of age will be diminished. Stratifying the study sample for age groups would be proper in a study of osteoporosis, but not in the study of trophoblastic disease where another stratification is warranted, such as parity, not the age. Now, you would argue that a regression analysis or iteration would take care of the valency issue. Could be true to some degree, but why not to understand upfront the valence of the modeled variables to properly design the study to save time and funds? Let's continue.
A bit of matching. Due to the space limit, I have only listed matching options for propensity score measurements, such as grid or caliper matching, without detailed explanations. Now I will expand it. Although there are more than 12 matching approaches, at the core matching is about reducing the confounding effect in observational studies. Matching must be used with caution, because if the number of sample units is small, power can decrease by matching. This is how it works. Once a matched sample has been formed, the treatment effect can be estimated by directly comparing outcomes between treated and untreated subjects in the matched sample. As the difference between the mean outcome for treated subjects and the mean outcome for untreated subjects in the matched cohort. And if the outcome is dichotomous, the effect of treatment is estimated as the difference between the proportion of subjects experiencing the event in each of the two groups in the matched sample. With binary outcomes, the effect of treatment can also be described using the relative risk or NTT, need to treat. Once the effect of treatment has been estimated in the propensity score matched sample, the variance of its effect and statistical significance can be estimated. Sampling without replacement means that once a subject has been matched, it cannot be used in another match. As a result, each untreated subject is included in at most one match set. By contrast, Matching with replacement allows a given untreated subject to be included in more than one match set. When matching with replacement is used, variance estimation must account for the fact that the same untreated subject may be in multiple matched sets. In greedy matching, a treated subject is first selected at random. The untreated subject whose propensity score is closest to that of the randomly selected treated subject is chosen for matching. This scenario is repeated until untreated subjects have been matched to all treated subjects. This process is called greedy because at each step the nearest untreated subject is selected for matching to the given treated subject, even if that untreated subject would better serve as a match in a subsequent set. Optimal matches are formed to minimize the total within pair difference of the propensity score. There is a risk, however, for phishing, because repeated tests for significant relationships, if uncorrected for the number of tests, can artifactually inflate statistical significance. Another threat is, if a treatment that is intended to be implemented in a standardized manner is implemented only partially for some respondents and effects may be underestimated compared with full implementation. Basically, the greedy algorithm is very simple. Take the closest, nearest, most optimal option and repeat. It always chooses which element of a set seems to be the best at the moment and it never changes its mind at a later point. Greedy algorithm is top-down as it makes one greedy choice to reduce large problems to smaller ones. The goal of greedy matching is to produce matched samples with balanced covariates across the treatment group and control group. It can generate one-to-one -one or one-to-many matched pairs sampled with replacement. In caliper matching, the reduction of bias is due to a single normally distributed confounding variable matched by using calipers whose widths are proportional to the standard deviation of the confounding variable. Similar reduction in bias can be achieved by matching the lagit of the propensity score using caliper widths. For instance, if the variance of the lagit of the propensity score in the treated subjects is the same as the variance in the untreated subjects, Using calipers of width equal to 0.2 of the pooled standard deviation of the lagit of the propensity score will eliminate approximately 99% of the confounding bias. 
Here, I present the level of evidence in various expressions of scientific research. This is important for those who like to conduct meta-studies that are vigorous for their ability to transform causal descriptions into causal explanations. Risk measurements are discreetly provided. OK, statistical bias. I will bring scenarios and examples for clarity. Confounding bias is when a third variable relates to both exposure and outcome and distorts the association of interest. Such a relationship was shown in slide 21. An example, a study finds that generalized anxiety is associated with gastrointestinal problems such as nausea or diarrhea because the study fails to recognize that persons with anxiety typically have insomnia and some of the insomnia medications cause diarrhea and nausea Matching is one solution because it distributes confounders evenly between the groups. Selection bias has subtypes. Sampling or ascertainment bias is stemmed from a situation where the selected sample does not accurately represent the population it is intended to, which diminishes the study's external validity and generalizability. Let's look at a few examples. A study that intends to dismiss the election fraud claims inadvertently selects intermittent voters who are less engaged in politics and admit that they often do not know enough about the candidates to cast ballots. Or a study inadvertently recruits members of a lower socioeconomic class by offering a small financial compensation or a study of atherosclerosis does not have participants over 60 years of age. That study may have strong internal validity, but will lack external validity and can't be extrapolated to the general population. A solution is randomization. The next subtype of selection bias is susceptibility bias, conditioned by selecting sicker patients for a more invasive treatment. Example, sicker or terminal patients get selected for surgical management of melanoma, skin cancer, and the results show that medicinal or radiation treatments of melanoma are associated with better outcomes Yet, it is simply because patients in the non-surgical treatment group were healthier at baseline. Solution again is the randomized study. Attrition bias is formed when the loss to follow-up is unequal between the intervention and control groups and that makes the intervention seem more effective. Example, a psoriasis medication may work for some patients but cause side effects in others. So, the treatment group consists of psoriasis patients who are given medication and if it is effective, they are eager to stay in each phase of the trial. But there are participants in treatment group that have experienced side effects or no effects at all and being disappointed, they drop out from the study. Because of this unproved withdrawal, the medication appears to have cured psoriasis effectively and more consistently because of the dropouts. A solution is to reach out the dropouts and collect as much data from them as possible. Measurement bias or Hawthorne effect takes place when participants change their behaviors during the ongoing study. Example. Patients with coronary artery disease are in a medication trial. Over the course of the study, some who have dental cavities treat their caves and the hidden dental inflammation. These particular patients are having better outcomes in the coronary disease study because treating their dental caves removes a causality chain to cardiac disorders but these good outcomes are then wrongly attributed to the medication studied in the trial. 
This type of bias is called Hawthorne effect after the experiments that had taken place at the Western Electric Factory in the Hawthorne suburb of Chicago in the late 1920s and 30s. Recall bias. This is when a patient's memory of exposure is affected by his awareness of his current disorder. Rephrasing, a patient with lung cancer reports a significant exposure to secondhand smoking as a child. In the meantime, another participant of the study, who does not have lung cancer, yet had the same degree and duration of exposure, forgets that his elder brother was constantly smoking indoors and exposing him to tobacco when he was a child. The solutions are data triangulation by reliable and objective sources or conducting a prospective cohort study. Let time bias. Detecting a disease earlier may be misinterpreted as improving survival. Example, a 69-year-old patient with follicular thyroid cancer survives only five years after he presents with a lamp on the neck, trouble swallowing and vocal changes to increased hoarseness. The blood test of carcinoembryonic antigen CEA, and calcitonin in the same patients at the age of 55 years would have confirmed the diagnosis and aftermath. This patient would live 19 more years. However, it doesn't mean that he would have an increased lifespan or survival rate. Therefore, it would be an error to conclude that his early screening and detection of cancer improved his survival rate. Solutions could be scrutinizing the studies to determine whether this bias is involved or adjusting survival rates according to the severity of disease, such as computing the survival rate based on the TNM staging of cancer and not from the date of detection. Late look bias happens when the information is gathered too late to make reasonable conclusions because the research subject with a terminal disease could be dead already or unable to respond. For example, a study of patients with prostate cancer reveals only minimal symptoms because those who have severe manifestations of cancer are too ill to respond or are already deceased. A solution is stratifying the sample for the severity and stage of the cancer. Check again matching and stratification on slides number 17 and 26. Omission bias is when removing or absence of certain variables results in unfitness of the model for regression analysis. This concept is related to the understanding of protected values, PV that study participants think should not be traded off. Some people are willing to sacrifice values to prevent losses more than they are willing to sacrifice these values for gains. Thus, the bias toward omission is greater when potential regret is present, and potential regret is greater when knowledge of outcomes is expected. Put simply, it is the tendency to judge harmful actions as worse than harmful inactions, even if both actions and inactions have similar consequences. Let me clarify with examples that include no harm whatsoever but benefits by omission. There is a term drug synergy. It is when concurrently administered medications are cross-efficient and produce better results than that of each medication administered alone. For example, there are synergic relationships between aspirin and caffeine, and so we have ascofen. There are both physiological and medicinal synergies between calcium and vitamin D, or magnesium and potassium. There is a synergy between the iron chelators like lactoferrin and antifungal drugs such as amphotericin B. There is a synergic relationship between some antibiotics such as beta-lactams and aminoglycosides because beta-lactams damage the bacterial cell membranes and aminoglycosides inhibit protein synthesis. 
Each of those antibiotics alone has a lesser impact than their joint effect because by damaging the bacterial cell membranes, beta-lactams allow more aminoglycosides enter the cell to inhibit protein synthesis in the bacteria. Now, let's suppose that drugs X1 and X2 are synergic. There is a clinical trial for drug X1 and the condition of the study is that patients honestly report if they are taking the drug X2 at home because it will be an exclusion criterion for the study. Either some patients omit that they take the drug X2 at home to remain in the study for some financial compensation or curative benefits, or the researchers themselves omit the facts that some subjects are taking both X1 and X2 drugs concurrently to show better results from the tried medication. So, what would be the biostatistical solution in this case? It is in using best projection reiterative truncated projected least squares, or BPRTPLS, a third generation technique that solves the omitted variables problem without using proxies or instruments. Procedural bias. Here, the patients are treated diversely depending on their arm of the study. Example, a study has two arms of intervention, one surgical, the other medicinal. Patients assigned to the surgical arm are followed more closely than those assigned to the non-surgical arm. Solution is in the double-blind study. Experimental expectancy bias or Pygmalion effect is when the desire or ambitions of the researcher influence the outcomes of the study. Example, a researcher who is also a practicing physician dermatologist and hopes to treat Argyria, a rare skin disease, persuades his subjects of the experimental group that the interventional medication will work and will cure their disease. A solution is again in double-blind assignment to prevent researchers and subjects from knowing which arm of the study they have been assigned to. Finally, funding bias, which is self-explanatory. Often, the donors control the outcomes of the patronage studies. Okay, from here I will leave you alone with the review questions and answers. Goodbye.